I have the big pleasure to announce an intellectual ping pong. Ping pong because it will be a, a back and forth talk with, from Hilary Mason, a wonderful data scientist, founder of Bitly, and now a great owner of a great company, she will explain in a minute, and Andrew McAfee from the MIT. Andrew, as you know, wrote this really essential book, Second Machine Age, and I'm so happy that the two of them agreed to do ping pong on our sofa. Come, please. <laughs> Hilary, what's the name of your company? It's called Fast Forward Labs. Okay, Fast Forward Labs. Sorry, I just forgot it, but check it out. It's amazing. What it is all about. So start the ping pong. Great. Uh, hi, everybody. And hi, everyone. Thanks, Steffi, for that. Uh, Hillary and I, when we were talking about this session, were conceptualizing it more as a cage match to the death. Um, but, but ping pong might be a p more polite way to think about it. So the format that the two of us agreed on is that we're going to take turns asking each other questions. The main ground rule was that we did not tell each other what the questions were going to be in advance. So I think neither of us has absolutely any idea what's coming. You're kicking off. I think the other ground rule, let's allow ourselves one follow-up per question if we want. Okay. And go from there. Sounds good. Hit me. All right. So in 2011, you wrote a short book called Race Against the Machines. Um, in this book, you talked about how the machines are going to take the jobs, right? And it was really, it was articulated very well. And it was perhaps the first articulation of this that really sort of caught the, the attention of our community. So it, it's 2017. Were you right? Uh, I, I, I reject the question altogether. Great. <laughs> uh, because we tried to be a little bit more nuanced than saying the robots are taking all the jobs, even in that early book. And we've tried to be nuanced ever since then, despite the fact that basically, no offense to our journalist colleagues in the room, every journalist wants to write the robots are eating all the jobs story. The yes. story that we told, we tried to be a little more nuanced and said technology is racing ahead, and you and I both believe that, but it's leaving some people behind in their capacity as folk who want to go offer their labor to the economy. I do still believe that. The biggest problem with that story is that there are still lots and lots of jobs out there. The American economy adds net jobs every month for more than six years. The headline unemployment rate is below 5%. That doesn't square really well with a lot of people being left behind. Exactly. The, the salvation, I think, is that while the engine of job creation used to turn out a lot of really good, solid, American classic middle class jobs, it's been downshifted into a lower gear, where we're kind of kicking out a lot of lower middle class, more precarious, more service sector, fewer benefits kinds of jobs. And it is, and I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming that that good old fashioned American middle class is under pressure, is really getting hollowed out. I still believe technology is absolutely part of that story. The last little thing is that while the headline unemployment rate is below 5%, we also have unique in the rich world, we have an absolutely huge population of primarily prime age men who are completely not in the workforce anymore. So they're not even counted in the unemployment statistic. Uh, I kind of think that the fact that we don't need lots of assembly line workers might have something to do with that. So let's bring this back a little bit and say, if you, would you still write exactly what you wrote in 2011? Anyone who would go back and write the same book with six more as your experience is a moron. All right. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so, so no, and I, I think we might, I, I was probably guilty of ringing the bell a little bit too loud saying, oh my God, all the robots are going to take all the jobs. That's actually not what's happened. And the, the smart pushback that I got back in that time and continuing from folk like Mark Andreessen is you are underestimating the energies of innovation and entrepreneurship. And I believe that's how I did underestimate that. However, those energies are not being applied toward cranking out, again, classic upper middle class American jobs. Entrepreneurs are finding lots of eight to ten dollar an hour jobs for people to do out there. Now, we should still celebrate that. That's better than no jobs, but it's not the same as we were doing in the past. Makes sense. All right, my turn? Yes. Why are there so few women who do what you do? <laughs> uh, if I knew the answer to that, by definition, I would probably not do what I do. I'm not, I don't see how that follows. Because if whatever had gotten in the way that had gotten in the way for everyone else, um, I probably wouldn't be here today. But what I can tell you is that um, there are many 
doing what I do involves a, a mix of sort of technology, creativity, storytelling. It's a mix of disciplines. Many of those are technical disciplines. Access to that background in technical disciplines is a lot harder to come by unless you look like you belong. So you want to know why I'm wearing jeans? It's so you will give me credibility as an engineer without me having to prove it to you. No, it's not. It's because jeans are comfortable. You would not be dressed in a three-piece suit <laughs> with a pearl necklace if, like, that's not your default choice. It's not my default choice because this is the role I play. I own one suit. I right. can do it. I'm, I'm, I know, I'm sure you can, but that's, mm -hmm. not, that's not, I don't think, who you are. I don't think you're putting on an act to be this person. Not at all, but it is, a, you know, fashion, the kind of language we use to present ourselves, the titles we choose are all props we use to communicate what we want to communicate. But let me, let me turn your question around and say, you know, the work that I do is building machine learning systems that solve real problems. Um, at Fast Forward Labs, we do our own applied research. We also work with uh, companies, large uh, companies, Fortune 1000 companies and startups to sort of help them build excellent data products. We have a lot of women on our team. Um, we try to build products that actually serve people well. And I believe that you need to have the perspectives of the people who will use those products represented in the creation of those products, especially when you're talking about things like machine learning and data products, where the practice of developing these products is not yet widely understood. It's not a commodity skill set. It's talent that's hard to find. And so we, uh, we need to be thinking about this as we think about what we want to do with it. I, I'm not sure how that ties to the gender question. Because if, um, actually I spoke to someone this morning who said in their orientation at their new job at a technology company, there were 50 people in the room, three women. Um, if those are the people who are building technology for all of us, the technology will not be useful for all of us. My follow-up? Okay. Um, is self-selection no part of the answer to my question? It's more complicated than that. Right? So what leads people to select one option over another? Right? Um, one thing I do know is this is not a pipeline problem. This is a problem that once people get into an environment, they are not supported, they're not mentored, they're not promoted, they're not judged on their potential the same way other folks are. Um, and so if this is something you care about, it is your job to fix it. It's not mine. Fair enough. Great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So in your last book, The Second Machine Age. Now I'm looking forward to this one. <laughs> yeah, well, well, um, you made several, you sort of made this case for how technology is changing quickly and is a disruptive force. And then you made several recommendations. And these recommendations were things around universal basic income as a potential policy. They're around education. And I have two questions for you on this. One of which, do you think this will actually solve the problem? Aren't these kind of a cop-out that you sort of put at the end of the book to say, OK, and there is hope? Um, and then the second question, which is related to this, is the technology is changing so quickly. And these policies are not just changing slowly. They're, they seem to be, in my personal opinion, changing in perhaps the wrong direction. Um, so what hope do we have? Um, the single best critique we ever got about the book came really early on in one of the Q&A sessions, and someone said, aren't you guys proposing linear solutions to an, to an exponential challenge? And it's like, eh, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're out of time, I think was my response to that <laughs> one. Um, the honest answer is nobody knows because we're not doing even the basic linear things. We don't know how fast the labor force is changing. And we, I would need to say this again. We are not at peak labor. We are not anywhere near peak labor. If you look at the evidence, the American economy adds hours of labor, religion, like clockwork, month by month. I'm going to worry about the end of labor and maybe the need for a universal basic income when that curve starts to flatten out in non-recession years. That has not happened yet. So I think what we need is a policy environment that accelerates top-line economic growth and positions both um, employers and entrepreneurs and people who want to be workers as best possible to go succeed in that. Uh, I, do, I am not giving up on the, the entrepreneurial, the, 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 the energy of American enterprise 
Yeah, that's really throwing in the towel. My Silicon Valley friends kind of want to do a basic income and we can all go to Burning Man all the time. I, I, I think that's a ludicrously bad idea for the simple reason that when you look at the communities where work has gone away, it ain't Burning Man. Uh, like, these are, read Hillbilly Elegy, these are deeply troubled places. My thought experiment is, how many of those problems in those communities will be solved by a monthly check from the government? My answer to that question is precisely none. Okay. So may I ask a follow-up? Yes. <laughs> uh, the singularity in general AI, is it real or is it bullshit? Uh, it's, it's, um, it's the worst um, flavor of bullshit going on in the tech world these days. <laughs> It's, it's, the single, it's actually pernicious bullshit. That's how bad it's harmful bullshit. Um, my, my favorite response to that, I'm going to channel Andrew Ng, who you know is an absolute rock star uh, machine learning researcher, is the guy inventing a lot of these technologies. When he gets confronted with questions about killer robots and the singularity and superintelligence and all this, his response is really straightforward. He said, this is like worrying about, super about, this is like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. Right? It's, it's that far away, it's that remote, it's that implausible. We have actual problems we need to solve on the world today. Um, we have been handed a uniquely powerful, very new toolkit to go mal manage those problems. And we're worrying about like, like people who read too much sci-fi. I, I, I find that absolutely perverse. So I actually read a lot of sci-fi and I also agree with you completely. Right on. <laughs> Good. See, someone who invents these technologies. Are you, are you inventing killer AI? That's, that's, I guess killer that's my next question AI? to you. Killer AI? Yeah. Is there anything on the, on the path of what you're doing that would take us into an era where we need to worry about these machines becoming conscious or willful or deciding they don't like meat or, or whatever? No, but we do need to worry about machines that reflect the biases of humanity put into places where they have operational responsibility to make decisions that that bias can be very damaging. Give us an example. So there was a great study from ProPublica about a proprietary for-profit criminal justice sentencing algorithm that made a recidivism prediction. So you have somebody who is being tried for something, the judge gets a score out of this black box system that says how likely they are to reoffend. The score, you don't know anything about where it comes from, how it's calculated. ProPublica showed that there was racial bias in this score. This to me is highly unethical and exactly the sort of situation where we don't currently have a framework for evaluating what is okay and what is not, and we need one now. Here's why I disagree with you. You know okay. what's even more biased than that method? The status quo exactly what we're doing now. The research is overwhelming that decisions about bail and parole and things like that are influenced by all kinds of factors, including the blood sugar of the judge at the time Absolutely. of day and including the race of the defendant. I also I, like, if, I had, if I had a choice blood. between those fallible, biased, messed up human judges and a black box algorithm that had been proven to have a, a lower false, po false uh, positive so rate. No, that's a, no, that is absolutely the choice that we have. That, that is the choice we have right now. See, well, for one thing, this is a proprietary technology from a poor you know, profit company. Our brains company. are proprietary tech. We cannot access our own knowledge about why we make decisions. The judges will come up with, a, with an explanation. It will be wrong. But you're acting like these are the only two possible things me, that could possibly exist. Give me, when, option, fact, give me option C. We could have an interpretable algorithm. Okay, work on that. All right. We are, in <laughs> fact, working on that. Okay, and, uh, that, wait, that's my question. Uh, why are these systems so uninterpretable and when and how, uh, and is that likely to change? So, systems are, un is, when you think about machine learning, what you have is a lot of data. That data, you're trying to learn something from that data that can then be used to make a prediction, and that prediction is usually of the form of, I have a lot of data, I have a data element with a label, and now I have a data element without a label, can I predict what label it's going to get? Yes, okay. So. A lot of the mathematics we've used, and this has been true for many years, essentially takes the, the data and projects it into a multi-dimensional space where in order to make these models and computations, you compress it. And when you compress it, you lose aspects of the meaning. And so that means that you can get an answer out, but you don't always know why. You don't know what features of that data um, inform that answer, and that's okay. And so we have many applications today where, um, where that's fine, right? Um, what has changed is the use of neural networks in deep learning, mm. which abstract not only the features, the interpretability of the features, but the feature design as a creative human process is instead done by a machine. Okay. 
And we have no idea what those features are. The boxes are getting blacker, in other they're words. They're getting blacker. Can, and so, can, do we have flashlights? Yeah, we're building flashlights. And so at Fast Forward, we have one project on this. There's a ton of great work out there. If you want to Google it, there's a great paper on something called Lime, um, which is very readable. Uh, but what you essentially do is then, OK, you have your black box system, and it's spitting out its labels on new data. Um, and then you build another system that permutes the inputs to that black box and looks at how the outputs change to reverse wow, engineer nice. how those features work. And this is something that can give us insight. And it also Clever. gives us the ability to edit the way the system works. Oh. Um, and there's indeed some experimentation now with using mechanical turkers to do feature engineering, which is usually something yeah, yeah. machine learning folks do uh, with great success. Um, so there are lots of applications for this sort of thing. And awesome. a, a black box isn't only a black box because of mathematical reasons. It can also be a black box because it's locked up inside uh, an API or a company mm. that has no interest in sharing what they're doing. Right. So there are lots of applications here. And this is becoming more and more important because of the increase in the use of these deep learning neural network techniques. Got it. Your turn. All right. Um, let's just, we're almost at the end. So I want to end with something hopefully optimistic and a little bit forward looking. So two years, five years, and 10 years from now, uh, what does the world look like? And what do we, the people in this room, have to think about uh, in order to get to a place that's tolerable? Uh, the, the world is going to get, and I, I, my predictions on this are clear over all three of those time frames. The world, unless we screw things up massively, the world is going to get more um, wealthy and prosperous and abundant overall. The overall pie is going to get bigger while we simultaneously take better care of our planet. With the one big exception that we're cooking it and we need to stop. Like, let's, put, like, let's be clear about that. Most other environmental indicators that you would want to look at are getting better instead of worse. That's going to accelerate because of these crazy powerful technologies that you and your friends are working on. The challenge is that there is no economic law that says the distribution of that, great, of that bigger and bigger pie is going to happen in a way that was the same as in the past, that is equitable, that strikes us as fair, that's not going to lead to us electing demagogues and voting to leave uh, multi-country unions and things like that. So people in this room need to work on, on thinking about what a better society looks like when the forces might be tending more toward concentration of the stuff as opposed to an equitable distribution of the stuff. Cool. We've got 15 seconds. Uh, what? Uh, okay, final question for you. Uh, biggest, what are you most optimistic about? What are you most pessimistic about three to five years? All right, what I'm most optimistic about is the creation of machines that interface with us using the same interfaces we use with each other as human beings, things that actually help us take the words we say and encode that meaning and better understand each other. We're out of time for pessimism. Come on. Thank you, Andy. Ten no. <laughs> All right, end on optimism. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>